So um, in a sense, what we've been talking about so far with uh, scientific visualization and Infobiz to a large extent, we've been talking about discrete data. And in topology, we're really interested in connectivity. So topology in math is in a sense the same as topology for messes. The only uh, the, the topology is the connectivity. And the big difference is that when you talk about topology in mathematics, you're talking about connectivity in an almost continuous sense. Um, whereas in uh, visualization, in uh, computational geometry, we're really talking about it in the discrete sense. Um, and there are overlaps. They're really, in a sense, the same concepts, uh, but it takes maybe a little bit of a, um, you need to wrap your head around it in a slightly different way. So when we talk about connectivity in the continuous sense, we're talking about manifolds. Um, so sections of three-dimensional, uh, well, of, of arbitrary dimensional space uh, in a continuous setting that are going to stretch or bend, or, and you want to be able to identify how many holes they have, for example, and how they're connected. So you know, can you orient it in a different way? Um, it, a good way of thinking of this is, yeah, if you bend space, if you have a sheet of rubber, how does this sheet transform as you twist it, bend it, do other things to it? Um, so so the, the canonical examples that are thrown up in, in intro topology and classic mathematics are the bridges of Konigsberg, where you want to be able to figure out how to cross from one side to the other, taking the minimum, or in some cases, maximum number of, uh, of bridges. The Mobius strip, which is a uh, essentially a, uh, a, or a very simple strip that's oriented, and uh, it just uh, the orientation is flipped, so you're able to go over both edges of it at the same time. Um, and then the canonical topology example, which is morphing a uh, uh, morphing a coffee cup into a donut, uh, because these uh, uh, these uh, objects have the same genus. So, going back to uh, not just 2D, which we had uh, in last this last IBIS lecture, but the 1D case. Uh, remember, we were talking about minimum and maxima and saddle points. In the 1D case, uh, these are very, very easy to find. The minima are, uh, and maxima are both regions where you have derivative zero. And then there, there are no saddles. You just have minima and maxima in 1D. Um, and this partitions the domain into monotonic regions, which is very nice. It means that we'll have no crossings in between. And you can, in a sense, use this to simplify a 1D plot um, into something that's a lot less noisy. Uh, in 2D, uh, remember the examples that we had from the lecture last time, where we had minima in the valleys um, and uh, maxima at the peaks, and saddles are, you know, really just think of this like a saddle on a mountain range. Um, and uh, what you're mostly interested in doing with a topological summary of this would be to describe the whole uh, topographical map when in the least or, or fewest number of contours, or the most interesting uh, contours. Um, and in a sense, this is what the contour tree and the merge tree that we'll see in a few slides, that, that's what they're doing. And we use the, these in scientific visualization all the time. Um, so minima and maxima are generally called critical points of scalar functions. So we're dealing with scalar field topology still, no vector fields. Um, and the connection of minima and maxima, of all these critical, critical points, generally is the topology of the scalar field. Um, and really, this concept uh, extends to any n-dimensional scalar field. Uh, so if you have, in, generally, a, an n-dimensional scalar field, and you're no longer looking at the first derivative of one dimension, you're looking at the first derivative of n dimensions. So this would be the gradient vector, uh, so del f. And then when not zero, um, it, it, basically what you're looking at is how uh, you go, it, it's sort of like gradient descent. You're starting at the critical point and you're always going to either go up or down uh, it, from a maximum or minimum. And from a saddle, you'll be able to go um, either up or down. Uh, I should probably explain this in a slide. Um, so yeah, here we go. Uh, at a local minimum, you can, you can only always go up. At a saddle, you can go up or down. And then a local maxima, you can only go down. Um, and classification of the, these critical points is, uh, in a sense, the most fundamental way of analyzing data in scalar field, and in fact, in vector field and tensor field uh, analysis. Um, it's sort of a intrinsic way of decomposing the data set into the features that matter. Um, so the big difference when you go from 2D to 3D scalar fields, uh, so 2D would be high fields and 3D would be volumes, is that all of a sudden you no longer just have two, uh, one type of saddle where you can go in 
um, one of two directions, all of a sudden you have two types of saddles. You have one saddles and two saddles. But this is um, sort of a uh, sort of a technicality that unless you're building a more spatial complex, you uh, don't really care about too much. Um, Speaking of Morse scale complexes, a function is a Morse function if it is smooth and all of its critical, critical points are isolated and non-degenerate. Um, from Josh Levine's slides, he claims this is a good assumption for scientific data. I'd actually disagree. <laughs> in, uh, in some cases, I, I would say you have large regions where you do have points that are degenerate. For example, if you have zero gradient and you, you uh, like a large flat region, and you can't really tell if it's a minima, a maxima, or a saddle because there is no gradient. Um, so in a sense, to make something that's degenerate into a field that's non-degenerate, very often you'd have to add a little bit of noise or fake it somehow. So to make something that had originally had no defined gradient into something with a defined gradient. Um, but assuming you have a gradient, assu assuming your manifold is smooth and um, so essentially uh, it, uh, C infinity differentiable, which is a big assumption, but in practice a good assumption, um, you can actually apply all these topological methods to it. So, um, the simplest example of how to construct uh, topology in the discrete setting, so if you're giving a mesh of a torus, is to um, essentially construct a read graph out of it. Um, and the easiest way I can think of showing this, this is sort of a more of a a toy example as opposed to something you actually do in visualization, is to turn the z axis, so the height axis in the spatial domain, into the value. So all of a sudden, instead of having something in three space, um, you have some f of x, y, and the z would be the, it would be the scalar field. Um, and now we have the, dunk, the donut dunking example, where you're basically dunk, dunking it um, into a plane, uh, and this is, in a sense, creating a level set from a, um, so a, a 2D level set from a 3D object. And you can see there's a, there are a few points of interest where you basically go from having connectivity, so, so one connected object to having two connected objects and then go, going back to having one connected object. So it's really, again, sweeping up the z-axis. And when you do this, you're able to build a graph that looks a bit like this. Um, so it's a very nice, simple graph. And this is called the read graph. Um, what's important to note is the vertices of this graph are critical points. Arcs of the graph are connected components of the level sets uh, that are contracted to points. And the algorithm is actually amazingly simple. It's basically locate the critical points as you're going sweeping through the dimension of interest and then connect them together. And that is how you build a read graph. This gets much more complicated when you have a lot of critical points and you have to decide which points are connected to each other. Um, but in a paper in 2007, uh, Valeria Piscucci, Timo Bremer, and uh, a lot of the, the group here at Ski, um, put, uh, I guess uh, back then they were uh, Livermore um, and other places, uh, essentially did this for very, very large um, or uh, moderate size uh, models from the scan, uh, Stanford Scanning Repository. And you know, this is, I would say, more computational geometry than visualization. But the important thing is that these same concepts apply to visualization. And in fact, they're probably, in a sense, more useful in visualization than they are in computational geometry. Computational geometry, that shows that it can be done. But in visualization, we're actually able to use this to do things like classify transfer functions, determine which isosurfaces, which isovalues, um, reflect critical points um, in, uh, of the, uh, you know, where you have changes on, in connectivity uh, across the whole domain. Um, this uh, paper on, on the right, the, uh, this is the assigned reading that I gave you, uh, which is the uh, computing, uh, the Danish Carr paper on computing contour trees in all dimensions. And the idea here is that uh, you're actually able to build a contour tree much more effectively than uh, sort of a brute force watershed algorithm going through all critical points, you're actually able to construct it as the intersection of two uh, much simpler structures, um, the split trees and join trees, which can be extracted via an algorithm called union find. So this was sort of a, uh, this was an algorithm that uh, changed contour trees, which are really essentially read graphs, uh, for being something that was extremely difficult to compute into something that all of a sudden was uh, possible and even and desirable to compute. And how we can use this in practice um, 
You know, think of the contour tree or the merge tree as really telling you the set of interesting ISO values and using that to better decompose and classify your data set. So if you're able to do this, you end up having, uh, and this is a merge tree, which is just the join tree. It's just sort of one sweep instead of the combination of both sweeps and both directions going up and down the range. But the idea is that you're able to turn any sort of 3D scalar field into a graph, into a tree that shows the sort of nesting, the onion layers um, of that 3D data set. The same way we think of a height field. We can think of a height field as sort of a nesting of, of um, uh, you know, valleys to saddles to peaks. So this is a very powerful concept and there's a lot of active research still um, going into this. Um, and in fact, I'd say for contour trees, uh, it's in a sense, uh, past the point where it's pure research and it's actually starting to be used in the domain sciences uh, to a large extent. So now I'll talk about more smale complexes. Um, more smale complexes are not dealing with the raw range value. They're dealing with topology of the gradient field. So again, you have the, the critical points, and here we're in 2D, uh, and we have uh, a maximum at the top, saddles in between, and the, the uh, minima. And the more smale complex is looking at the intersection of two structures, the ascending manifolds, which go from the minima upwards, and the descending manifolds, which go from the maxima downwards. Um, and you put these together, and uh, if you intersect these, you end up having cells, uh, or so-called crystals, of the Morse male complex. And looking at these crystals, what they're really doing is they are decomposing a, da a data set into regions that are monotonic. And they're not monotonic in one di direction the same way you had easy monotonicity for 1D curves. They're monotonic potentially in multiple directions where you, you have a saddle that's pulling things in a negative value for one corner, a maxima that's always positive for another corner. So it takes your head a little bit of time to wrap around this, but this is still a very, posi a very powerful concept. And even before discrete more spale complexes, uh, especially the work from Attila Jalassi, were being um, extracted. You see uh, literature in, for example, the chemical sciences uh, with beta analysis that were essentially doing the same thing, that were decomposing space into regions of like gradient and doing that for analysis. Um, so actually, I'm going to skip over this slide and I'll talk a little about, a bit about the applications of the Morse Mayo complex. So what you can use um, Morse, uh, Morse theory for in large scientific visualization uh, ideally, is simplification. That, that's sort of the most obvious, uh, uh, the most obvious application, where you're you're starting starting off with a fairly noisy or turbulent data set with a lot of detail, and you want to simplify this to cluster it somehow in a way that um, that sort of shows the large, more or less homogeneous regions of gradient in a hierarchical way. And the way you do this typically is a concept called persistence, where you're looking at how much uh, the range changes between a critical point, between, for example, a saddle and a maxima, or a saddle and a minima. And if that change is less than a certain amount, then you're just going to ignore it. And if it's, the change is very large, um, then you can filter, the, filter the, the persistence accordingly, and you can end up with very large um, structures like this. And you can do this in two dimensions, where, where you apply persistence filtering to simplifying a, um, uh, simplifying a, a high field uh, using, uh, using the Morse male complex in 2D. And you can also do, th do this in three dimensions. Um, it gets much more computationally expensive to compute a Morse male complex in 3D, but especially for large, turbulent uh, combusting data sets, the flow date data sets that we're going to look at um, in vector field visualization in just a little bit, this is a very good idea. And Attila and Bei Wang and myself uh, and several others at Argonne recently uh, applied a lot of this work in um, a, a, what I call a real science application. And this is figuring out how lithium penetrates uh, uh, carbon uh, nanosphere nanomaterials. Um, and the idea here is that you want to have some topological structure that tells you how big the defect sites are in an atom material so that ions can sneak through them. And you actually want to have some guarantees that the persistence me uh, metrics that you're using, um, it, that they will tell you what you want to know about your data set, regardless of um, 
uh, for example, uh, how much the, the ge geometry has been jittered by molecular dynamics uh, computation. Uh, so the way we did this was to, in, in the top case, use the original wave function data from, um, an ab from a first principles computation. In the bottom case, looking at um, much coarser and, uh, I guess, less guaranteed geometry. But what's nice about Morse theory is that uh, it actually sort of extends to both, to both approaches. So you can, uh, you can use persistence uh, thresholding as a way of uh, not just simplifying, but actually analyzing data and analyzing the movement of, of ions through chemical data sets like this. So now I will go on to flow visualization. Uh, sorry, here we go. So we remember um, from the, the original uh, SciViz grids lecture that you can have different types of grids. You can have scattered, uniform, structured, and unstructured geometry. Um, and you can specify, um, the idea in a vector field is that you have a vector um, at, at each element. And this is different from multi-fields in that um, the vector is the element of the grid. Um, so the scalar field would be a mapping from Euclidean space, n-dimensional Euclidean space to a single value, just uh, in the real number range. And a vector field is a mapping from n-dimensional Euclidean space to m-dimensional range space. Um, and usually m equals m, so if you have a 3 space, uh, th you know, 3D Euclidean space, you're going to have a 3D vector field. Not always. Um, and the idea in a vector field is that you can express this as, uh, as an ordinary differential equation and extract geometry using that ODE by essentially sweeping along the vector field. In a sense, this is sort of the vector field's equivalent of interpolation that we had in, uh, in 3D uh, scalar field, uh, in 3D scalar fields. Um, and when you solve this ODE, um, uh, this results in flow, which is the set of particle tra trajectories in the field um, depending on how you've chosen to solve uh, the differential equation. Um, and flow visualization, most generally, is about how we select, how we do this integration, and how we select and show trajectories of particles inside the vector field. So the applications for flow visualization uh, tend to be things like motion of fluids, um, uh, where you have uh, boundary conditions and moving particles inside them. Um, it, you want to show, um, you want to show uh, mostly fluid dynamics phenomena, so uh, simulations um, that are using the, the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, I'd say it's almost exclusively fluid dynamics uh, when you talk about flow. Um, in fact, I cannot think of a single example in flow visualization that isn't about a fluid of some kind. Um, actually, I guess there is. Guesses. Uh, uh -huh. Guess. Yeah, 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 I guess is, they're not fluids. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're right. They're, they're fluids. Um, there actually is an exception. Uh, chemistry, where you have um, molecular trajectories. They generate vector fields, and these are not really fluids. I mean, they have, um, in the aggregate, they would behave as fluids, but uh, at those small scales, they're, they will generate vector fields that are really just showing trajectories of atoms. Um, so I guess that would be the exception, would be something like molecular dynamic simulation. So now I'll talk a little bit about fluid dynamics and experimental flow visualization. So before we had not just math, but, uh, but before we had the computational ability to do this um, at, well, on computers, we, uh, people would use uh, real, real world physics to, to, be, able to, uh, to uh, be able to show this. So what they would do is very often they would um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see this is going to be kind of costly to set up. This is not the sort of simulation you want to, you know, you can run in your basement computer. Um, so, so what you do is you'd have um, yeah, a colored gas of some kind and you'd run various airfoils, cars, planes, etc. through it. Um, and you'd have entire facilities uh, operated by NASA or the Air Force um, that, that were essentially uh, it's essentially looking at the efficiency of their vehicles uh, by um, smearing gas around them and uh, seeing what the, effect, uh, what the effect was on the atmosphere around it. Um, yeah, okay, oh, there we go. A more recent example, this still happens, is uh, if you look at the smoke angel that comes out of the wake of a jet, uh, 
uh, you know, th this, this happened when uh, uh, the, the aircraft released flares over the Atlantic Ocean. And then you end up having this incredible uh, cloud formation that's purely the result of the waves in the engine. Um, and in a sense, this is maybe not the most practical thing you'd want to reproduce. Uh, but uh, you, you know, certainly, if you have a fluid dynamic simulation that's implemented correctly, this is what you would get. Um, more practically, for actually engineering the aircraft, uh, you would, uh, they have uh, devices like wind tunnels where you're uh, taking a scale model of your aircraft, you're running it through the wind tunnel, you're somehow marking regions of air, uh, m maybe by um, using a, uh, usually a, a, a more dense uh, uh, medium than air, or just you know, using incredibly high, uh, high pressure inside the wind tunnel. Um, and this may not be the absolutely most phys physically realistic way of uh, evaluating an, an aircraft, um, but it's better than nothing, and it will give you a sense of where you'll have trouble spots in the aircraft. So generally, anytime you see vortices, anytime you see turbulence uh, in the wake, so coming off of a wing, that's bad. That, that's a place where you have resistance, where you have drag, uh, that will eventually cause stress on, uh, on the body of your aircraft or vehicle, and those parts will eventually fail. So the whole goal is to have something as clean and non-turbulent as possible. Um, and in the automotive world, they would essentially do this in a very hacky way by attra attaching little tufts to the bodies of vehicles. Uh, and they still do this. I, I mean, the reality is that simulation has not completely taken over um, the, uh, uh, the fluid dynamics world. Um, you really need to do both. And the idea is that if you simulate something and it looks like it's going to be really, really horrible, you're less likely to make a scale model prototype, and then you're less likely to make a real life, uh, you know, a real world scale prototype. So it's it sort of, simulation is the first step um, of, of how you do this. So that's the experimental side. Um, you know, uh, I should show this one last cool video of smoke injection. Um, and you know, this is essentially one big vortex that's uh, the result of, uh, of an aircraft that's flown through here. Yeah, that's, uh, that's this, uh, uh, that same phenomenon. Uh, and this is all the result of essentially an aircraft flying through, through, the, the, through the region of smoke. Um, and this looks like really nice visualization to me, but this is actually a scale model. This is where they have, color, they have uh, colored smoke and they're running the scale model of, um, uh, of this aircraft through the colored smoke. And I'd say this, if we can achieve this in a computational setting, we're doing everything right. I guess the advantage of the computational setting is that, in a sense, there's less there's more flexibility on the part of the people implementing the fluid dynamics code, and uh, less wiggle room in terms of what you have to get right in terms of engineering the scale model. So here I've tried to condense all the fluid dynamics into one slide. Wish me luck. Uh, so fluid dynamics, uh, at a very high level, is about um, the Navier-Stokes equations which are not just one equation. It's really an entire set of partial differential equations that um, model the behavior of fluids. Um, and you know, here's just one example of a Navier-Stokes equation for compressible fluids. Um, and probably more useful on the right-hand side over here is something called the continuity equation. And the continuity equation is what essentially governs uh, the conservation of, uh, con conservation of momentum um, in the fluid. Uh, and you have similar conservation laws for mass and for energy. And all of these laws basically relate back to the second law of thermodynamics, which means, says that you can't really lose, uh, uh, you, you can't make energy go away. You always have an increase in entropy, um, and you, you, can't, you can't really recover that in any way, shape, or form. Um, so some terminology that shows up over and over again in the flow visualization literature and also in fluid dynamics a viscosity is essentially how much a fluid resists a deformation from shear or tensile stress. And this is a stress tensor with nine degrees of freedom, so not, uh, not something that we very often see in, uh, in the output of, uh, of simulations in practice. Um, the flow itself, it can be described as steady, which means that its time derivative um, is, is zero. That means that the vector field is not really going to change over time. Um, the vector field, a particle will still move through the vector field, but the flow won't really change. Think of a very, very slow moving stream, for example, um, and you're, uh, you're just floating along that stream. 
Um, and the opposite of that would be unsteady, which is if you have um, a flow that really changes from time to time. And that would be very often due to turbulence, due to a lot of uh, objects and vortices and things really going awry in your flow field. Um, a similar but not quite, this, uh, not quite exactly the same concept is laminar versus turbulent flow. Uh, so unsteady flow is by nature turbulent, but you can also have laminar flow, which uh, can be steady or unsteady, but laminar flow is really describing flow where the streamlines, uh, so, so the vectors all sort of uh, exist in parallel. And they can move around objects, but they're always going to join up at the end and exhibit this more or less parallel uh, behavior. Um, and lastly, there's the Reynolds number, which basically describes how turbulent your flow is. And this is uh, roughly speaking, actually exactly, the uh, ratio of inertial forces, so kind of how much momentum is going into the, system, into the system over the viscous forces, so the forces that govern how quickly your vector field is going to return to its sort of base state. Um, and there, I, I confess using a lot of Wikipedia resources for this slide. But uh, for anyone who is really hardcore and wants to know more about this, I recommend uh, going to the me mechanical engineering department. And if you don't have time for that, then use this book. I've actually referred to this a few times, um, mostly when I've had to look up what a term is and Wikipedia didn't do a good enough job. But Wikipedia has gotten actually a lot better in the last uh, six years since I referred to, uh, to uh, uh, flow visualization and uh, fluid dynamics literature. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's um, sort of the scientific motivation for vector fields, for you know, where we're getting most of our vector field data from. Um, and in engineering and science, once we have data sets like this, we want to make some sense out of that. And that's where visualization comes into play. So you use this in automotive design, in uh, meteorology, um, so oil spill trajectories. Uh, I had another example from, from my time at TAC where we were looking at red tide fl uh, flow through the ocean. Um, and then uh, aerodynamics around missiles, really any, any sort of, I say aerodynamics is by and large the, the main application for all of these CFD simulations. Um, so here are four different examples on auto bodies of some kind. You're trying to optimize airflow around the auto body. And by and large, you know, if you look at the vast bulk of CAD uh, visualization today, they're mostly using streamlines around vector fields. Uh, you know, these are techniques that have been around since the, uh, really, I guess, late 80s, and they are very, you know, very, very well accepted by now. And, of course, in aerospace, the whole reason you would do a simulation to begin with is because you don't have the, um, I guess, $50 billion to build a prototype scramjet. Um, and instead, you want to simulate it and see if the whole thing is going to collapse in short order once it, ex uh, once it exceeds Mach 7. Um, same thing with uh, prototype aircraft, um, with a space shuttle also. Uh, th these are um, techniques that we use because it is expensive to build and to launch these vehicles. So we want to optimize uh, airflow around them before we actually do that. So lastly, flow visualization. So we've talked about why we do it. And now we're going to talk about the how. And there are, I'd say, five general approaches to flow viz. Um, one is, the first one is using char the characteristic curves of the vector field, which really relate back to the, um, that first slide when I was talking about how you would integrate the ODE. Um, then uh, there, there's texture-based, there's uh, two sort of direct methods that one is based on just showing raw vectors themselves and the others are based on volume rendering. And um, I'll mention the where. Uh, so you can have flow in, uh, in two dimensions along the plane if the simulation is 2D. You can have flow on surfaces where you have, you're really interested in the flow over, um, uh, over bodies. So a lot of the, uh, the, C, uh, the, CA, the CAD simulations from uh, automotive or aircraft would, be, would fall to that category. Uh, and then you can have, can have more generally flow in three-dimensional three space. So characteristic curves of a vector field um, are streamlines, pathlines, streaklines, and timelines. And this makes a lot more sense when I show pictures, but I'll go over the, the math and the general concept. The streamline is a curve that is everywhere always tangent to the vector field. 
Uh, and the idea is that here you're only integrating over space and you're not integrating over time. So the idea is that if you convolve the vector field or, or if you sort of sort of somehow perfectly interpolated it, went from discrete to continuous, you'd end up with something like uh, a set of streamlines, of infinitely thin streamlines. And I should mention all of these techniques, streamlines, pathlines, streamlines, timelines, they're all for ideal massless particles uh, that aren't really going to be part of a physical simulation and they're just going to kind of follow the vector field however you integrate it. Pathlines are different from, from streamlines in that they integrate over both time and space. So instead of just taking one seed point and moving it tangent to the vector field, you are kind of reseeding at every step. And you're going to follow that through the vector field regardless of how the vector field changes. So if the vector field changes, then your particle is going to take a different path. Streak lines are, again, integrating over time and space. Uh, but the difference here is that you are only really seeding from a fixed position. So this would be very similar to that, uh, that wind tower, that, that tower that was emitting uh, dyed gas, uh, where the, the dye is only coming out from one specific point in space, and you're seeing how it evolves over time. So that would be a, a good example of a streak line, uh, except in that case it would be a streak volume or a streak, uh, probably more than a streak surface. Uh, it would be many streak lines. And then last, lastly, we have timelines, which um, they describe the motion of particles set out over a line of time through the vector field. And these are sort of like having a burst of particles at one point in time. So you have a burst of particles and you see how it flows through the field. Then you have another burst and you see how that flows through the field. Uh, those would be timelines. And um, if you look at time as this blue axis that's going up, and you're looking at just 2D, um, 2D vector fields, this is what each of these look like. So streamlines are basically going over static vector fields that aren't changing. Pathlines are um, essentially changing everything. They're moving through the vector field over time as it changes. Streak lines are just starting out with one, uh, one emitted point, that, uh, that, that ball that's over um, essentially uh, this axis. Um, and that, that stay, stays fixed in time. Um, I'm sorry, it stays fixed in space and, uh, and in time, really. And you're just emitting particles from that in a stream. Um, and then timelines, it's sort of like a burst over time where you have these three particles right here, and they're each emitting, but as time goes on, you, you sort of have new bursts that show up um, in your data set. And this makes a lot more sense when, uh, when you actually visualize this as, as a sweep over particles in time. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Ah, go back. Yeah, there we are. So this is sweeping over the, back, uh, over the streamlines um, that you see as the as the, fact, as the vector field changes over time, and the path lines as it changes over time. So you can see that streamlines are more or less static um, with respect to any given vector field, whereas path lines integrate in both time and space. And when we mentioned steady versus unsteady flow, streamlines are designed to show steady flow, um, and path lines are really designed to show um, unsteady flow, a flow that's evolving over time. So I mentioned timelines, they look a little bit like a burst. This is the best graphic that I could find that really shows what a timeline looks like, where you know, the timelines are being seeded along this line, and then you'll end up having something that more or less looks like this, but this is going to evolve as your, as your vector field evolves. Now, what happens when you have a steady vector field, um, a, ve a vector field that doesn't change at all? What, can anyone tell me what happens to stream, path, and streak lines? When the vector field is steady, they all coincide. They're all the same because there's no change in time. It's, it's all really just the same phenomena that you're showing over and over again. So how do we actually generate uh, streamlines, streak lines, and path lines? <coughs> so very simply by integrating. We're going to start with a point and we're going to take a fixed step in space and time, or, or in just in space in the case of streamlines and you're going to integrate. Um, the simplest way of doing this is first order Euler, which looks like this, where dt is the step size. Um, you're just going to go from point to point, and it's incredibly fast, but incredibly inaccurate. I'm going to skip through this relatively quickly in the interest of time. 
But the basic idea is that in addition to Euler, you can use second order Runge-Kata, which is sort of the equivalent of a uh, sort of a, a, a two point stencil. And you can also use a fourth order Runge-Kata, which is like a four point stencil. And you can use these to integrate streamlines in a much, uh, I guess, much more uh, numerically robust way uh, than you could uh, in the simple, you know, uh, the simple first order Eulerian case. And if you keep on integrating and you have a very nice streamlined integration, you end up with um, essentially perfect, uh, per perfect coincident uh, parallel vectors that really show the vector field as a, conti as a continuum. So this is uh, what happens if you integrate with Euler. And if you integrate, uh, you compare Euler to, um, I'm sorry, this is just Euler with different step sizes. And you can see that Euler with a, a small step size is fairly efficient, but Euler with a large step size is incredibly um, inaccurate. Um, so you, you have a lot of, you have very high error with, with uh, Euler. Ranga Kata 2 is slightly better, a lot better than Euler, um, but um, you can do even better. You can do Ranga Kata 4th uh, order, and I'd say uh, Ranga Kata 4th order is, uh, um, is probably the state of, it, it's the standard for, for how you do integration of streamlines and, and path lines and uh, everything else. Um, so that's, uh, that basically summarizes how we integrate streamlines. And these same concepts apply to stream surfaces, to stream ribbons, to any of the sort of um, characteristic curve-based geometry that you would want to show for flow visualization. So there is one important caveat, this question of how do we choose where to, put, where to place the seed points? And this is a problem for, for streamlines, pathlines, timelines, streak lines, et cetera. Um, but it's also a problem when you try to show surfaces. Yeah. And the reality is that it's very, very tough to place seeds in the right place. If you place them everywhere, you end up with a big noisy mess. And if you place them in the wrong places, then you're not really showing the phenomena that you want to show in the vector field. And not just is it a big noisy mess, but there's a lot of visual clutter. Um, you, you, it's, especially in 3D, it's very, very tough to look at poorly seeded streamlines. So uh, this, uh, the, I guess the, the simplest and most obvious approach to streamline pl pl placement would be to use a regular grid um, where you have regular sampling uh, just on a raster image. And what's surprising about this is that depending on how, what your vector field looks like, you can actually get a very irregular result from using a regular grid. And certainly it's better than nothing, <coughs> um, but ideally you want something like the image on the right. And there are several papers. Um, one of them is uh, part of the assigned reading. It's a paper from Turk and Banks in SIGGRAPH 1996 that was essentially um, coming up with more, well, well, some clever ways of, of uh, uh, doing seed placement for streamlines. And the idea of the Turk and Banks paper is that instead of having one big streamline that starts from a seed somewhere in space, you have very, very short streamlets, um, which are kind of going to adapt over time. So it's sort of like path lines, but smart path lines that know where to go and where to reseed based on what the vector field looks like around the path line. Um, and this was actually a very, a very impressive work that actually is still used, or variants of this are still used in a lot of common seam, uh, streamlined seeding algorithms. So I believe Paraview uh, uses a variant of this if you use its streamline generator. Um, and uh, you can do uh, similar things uh, to the Turk and Bank algorithm, even if you're not, um, even if you're not doing streamlines, but if you're doing texture-based uh, 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 vector field visualization. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and the Turk and Bank paper also did this not just for uh, for streamlines, but for glyphs that uh, for aeroglyphs where you have um, where you have uh, sort of uh, tapered tips and wider arrows that. Um, show the magnitude of the vector uh, of the vector field, and th so this is uh, I'd say this is in practice used less than uh, I, I, I saw this used in a lot of papers from the '90s, but not as much this day and age. In fact, maybe from someone from a design standpoint can speculate as to why as to why uh, tapered arrows aren't used very much in, in flow viz. 
I, I, I can speculate. My, my speculation is that the texture-based methods, by and large, replaced the, uh, the, um, the, the sort of infinitely thin streamline curve methods, at least in the, in the 2D setting. And in the 3D setting, methods like that don't extend very well. Uh, so actually, I'm going to st skip over that, and I'll talk about st um, streamlined seeding in 3D. Um, so again, we have the problem of uh, the fact that streamlined seeding doesn't really make sense uh, to just use a, a regular uniform grid. You end up with sort of gibberish. You maybe get a little bit of sense of flow, but, but having regular spacing doesn't really give you that much. And if you're doing, if you're, so, so actually this is uh, different from the Turk and Banks approach. This is uh, feature-based flow visualization where you're using critical points of the, um, of, for example, gradient magnitude. Uh, and you're using critical points of that to determine where to place streamlines. Uh, and this is actually very effective. So compare this image to this image. So the short story is that not only are you saving a lot of computation, but if you know uh, where to place streamlines, where to place the seeds, then you get a much nicer visualization with much less clutter. Um, and uh, especially back in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, Guoxi Li and Hanwei Shen were working on techniques to start with an ISO surface uh, that you thought was nice and representative of the data set, or start with features in the data set that you thought represented it well, and unproject them back into image space and use that, um, I, I'm sorry, for image, image space into world space and use that to seed streamlines more effectively. Um, there also has been some technique, um, several techniques that in streamline bun bundling, so trying to build a representative graph out of which streamlines are most important from a, uh, uh, fr from a feature analysis uh, uh, standpoint. Um, so in a sense, this is a little bit like the streamline equivalent of a contour tree, where you're trying to de determine which ISO surfaces are more important, more useful than others. Here we're trying to decide which streamlines are more, are more useful and more representative than others, and we're building some sort of uh, tree hierarchy out of them. And you end up with much, much nicer classifications and fewer streamlines like this. And uh, see there, oh, yeah? Uh, so back, uh, looking at these, these, these streamlines um, and your comment about glyphs, um, I guess directionality of flow isn't very obvious. From that's a good point. So yeah. Sometimes, like in an airplane simulation, or if you have river, it's obvious what the directionality is. But in this, these are weather. These examples, how do you convey directionality without glyphs? I think that's where aeroglyphs really do help. And you know, you see them a lot less in three D. I guess in two D, maybe it's that in two D. They're especially in these research papers. They're more interested in how do you place seeds, how do you sample, how do you do less work with more. So they're not really tackling the. You know, why would you use, uh, they're not really tackling that, that aspect of design. But I think you're right. I think that's absolutely it, um, is that uh, you can really get a sense of directionality if you use the aeroglyphs. Um, yeah, you definitely don't have it here. Uh, it, it, so, so, so this paper, this was a SIGGRAPH 2013 paper. It's extremely rare that flow visualization papers make it to SIGGRAPH. But this one did, um, mostly because what, it, what it's kind of doing that's unique is it is just brute force rendering all the streamlines and using an illustrative visualization technique to smartly determine which streamline should be more or less opaque. So it's sort of like an almost direct approach to streamlines where you're not really spending too much work on seed placement. You don't really care where you put the seeds, but you do care uh, how you actually render the resulting streamlines. And uh, in a sense, it's a little bit like the streamline bundling technique in that it's determining which are more important than others, but it's doing this in image space and it's able to come up with very compelling, very compelling results. Uh, so this was, I, I thought, a, a fairly interesting paper. Um, and of course, if you streamlines get complicated, if you apply global illumination to them, you can uh, get much, much nicer effects. You have a much better sense of depth. Um, so I, I've even played with that a little bit for some data sets in production viz. Um, so now I'm going to move away from streamlines, and I'll talk about uh, stream surfaces. Uh, so stream surfaces are. Um, sort of an extension of streamlines where instead of having a single C point, all of a sudden you have a C plane. And you're looking at the evolution of a surface as um, that set of seeds along the curve evolves with the vector field. And 
These sound great in principle, but in practice they're very, very tough to visualize because of occlusion. The fact that especially around the vortices, around the areas that you're most interested in, you tend to have stream surfaces that wrap around, you, around themselves and hide all the detail that you actually care about. Uh, so there is the, a, a series of illustrated visualization papers from Matthias Hummel uh, and Christoph Gartz, uh, now Christoph Gartz group at, uh, at Kaiser Slavern, uh, where they were using illustrative techniques to visualize stream surfaces and street surfaces. Um, Hari Krishna at LBL uh, also did a lot of work in this area. Um, you, um, and you have unique strategies for how to seed stream surfaces. I think actually showing the video was going to do much, much more... Uh, uh, this is going to help quite a bit more than anything else I can, I can show in, in, in static slides. This will really show how streak surfaces work. And you see those little bands. Those band so the, the transparent surface is the streak surface, but those bands are timelines in a sense. Remember I was mentioning the, the burst of particles over a time? Uh, it, that's, that's what a timeline is. And this is... Uh, between the street surfaces, so that semi-transparent geometry, and these bursts, you end up with very, very interesting visualizations of, of the vector field. So I'd say, in a sense, this is kind of state-of-the-art for, uh, for how to do a characteristic curve and surface-based flow visualization. And this is work from Christoph Gart and Hari Krishna um, uh, in 2008 and 2009. Also assigned reading. I think it recommended, though. <laughs> now, can anybody tell me limitations of this technique? Or is everyone just stunned? <laughs> well, it looks like they're starting from a specific point. So, like, if it was, like, a continuous flow that stayed that way, then, I don't know, like, it would be as interesting. Maybe some of the features wouldn't show up the way they do. That's it kind true. of starts from like the burst and then it then starts wrapping around, but once it's already in flow, like, it maybe Yeah, it's, it's tough to get rid of points. Um, and there are ways around that, um, definitely. Um, yeah, you're right, it gets cl more cluttered um, if you just let it go over time. Um, from my standpoint, I'd, I'd actually say you still don't have a very good sense of direction other than what's implied by looking at, um, looking at the video. So right. if you look at a still of this, um, then there's still, uh, there's still no aeroglyphs. Like actually, exactly what Alex said uh, about the aeroglyphs. And you know, I think that th this is something that none of these characteristic um, curve and surface techniques are going to be able to solve on their own without some help. So I'll cut this short, because um, you'll more or less get the idea. But I'd say this is pretty much the state of the art. In, char in characteristic uh, uh, curve and surface visualization. So moving away from that, we're going to talk about texture-based visualization. And I'd say this is the second most popular way of doing flow viz. The original approach was something called spot noise from uh, Jack Van Wick in SIGGRAPH 91. And the idea here is you start up with a bunch of blobs, and you want to smear them over the vector field and see what happens to it over time. And you can have colored blobs or non-colored blobs. Usually they have non-colored blobs, and, and they color it according to some additional field um, from, from the vector field or scalar field, like radiant magnitude. The downside of this um, is that everyone said, OK, it's, better than, it, it's maybe better than, stream, than streamlines in some ways, but it looks horrible. That said, if you take the same technique and you increase the resolution and you take lots and lots and lots of little, uh, little blobby shapes, at very high resolution, you can get some great looking images. So there is clearly potential in this approach. So line integral convolution from Cabral and Leadham to Graph 93 basically improved on spot noise in almost every way. And their intuition was that rather than starting out with a bunch of Gaussian or ellipsoidal or spherical blobs and smearing them in the texture, they started out with noise. Raw, you know, uh, uh, just white noise or in uh, some cases, they try Perlin noise, and they smear that noise over the vector field, convolve the vector field with the noise, and they end up with, you know, essentially a, like a perfect, perfectly interpolated vector field. So the idea is um, you start with a random texture, you smear this out over the path lines in a vector field, um, and 
The downside is that you have low correlation of intensity values between neighboring lines because you just started out with noise, but you have a high correlation. So it, because the, you have this sort of high contrast in between them, you can actually kind of see what's going on. So this, this is really the idea in a nutshell. So you, you see the vector field on top. Um, you have the, the, what the streamline would look like if you rasterized it onto the texture. And then you have the input texture down at the bottom, which is just the noise texture, and then the output image. Um, and this process does depend on the, the length of the filter that you're taking. So which is, this is sort of the equivalent of the number of steps you have in streamline integration. So with a filter length of 100, 100 steps, you get this incredibly nice image. With 50, it's, you know, you're maybe losing a little bit, a bit of detail around there, but it's still quite good. And if you go down, you lose more and more detail. And if you get down to essentially a filter length like of one, um, then you're not really doing much of a convolution at all. It's almost identical to the original noise texture that you have, just a little bit bumpier. And you can color lick fields. This is kind of optional. It doesn't really show you much about the gradient field itself, um, but uh, it looks nice. Uh, actually, going back to what Alex said, can you talk about other, uh, about the remaining d disadvantage of lick as it is? You still can't find, you can't determine the direction, yeah. Still can't determine the direction with lick. In a sense, it's even tougher with lick than it is with streamlines, because at least with streamlines and stream surfaces, they have a tip, they have a front. You know where the particles are moving from, from and to. And with lick, you sort of have this directionless flow. Um, but that said, lick is still pretty much the state of the art. Um, now, lick only works for steady flow in the original algorithm. There's a variant for unsteady flow that basically, instead of taking white noise and convolving it directly with the vector field, takes white noise and convolves it with a bunch of particles averaged over time um, that, are, that then go on to make this sort of un this averaged out representation of the unsteady flow. Um, and this, this way, you end up being able to run it on uh, to, to run lick on unsteady vector fields, so time-varying vector fields, uh, this is pretty much state-of-the-art. Uh, so uh, Goshi Lee uh, here at the Ski Institute, working with Chuck Hansen, did a, um, applied this to flow over surfaces, and you can also do this um, for three-dimensional, uh, three-dimensional visualization. Um, so uh, volume, uh, volume visualization from lick. This is much less common because it's very, very tough to do. Um, and some of the, the nicest work that I've seen from uh, work in uh, uh, Falk and Weisskopf in 2008 um, is sort of a, a classification that's almost filtering out most of, uh, most of the, uh, the volume. And it's only really looking at several streamlines. So you end up having really short streamlines. Um, and that's what 3D look looks like at its best. So in practice, 3D look isn't really used very much. And a lot of people sort of poo-poo it. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's no potential there, but it just means that advancements have to be made in terms of how we're doing 3D lake before this will uh, become more popular. Yeah, so I, I, there's one more paper that was recommended reading from uh, Jacqueline Wick uh, called Image-Based Flow Visualization. Um, and this is sort of a, a, a mix between lick and a streak line dye advection technique. Uh, where you're starting with a big blob in space and you're able to see it evolve over time. And this is something that you couldn't really do in plain lick. The downside of IBFE is that um, it, it gives you sort of advantages of lick and advantages of streak line specifically, but you still end up having poor spatial coherence and these kind of blobby shapes that go over the whole scene. And it's not that much better than lick uh, if you're not interested in sort of a, a streak line type visualization. So uh, I think I'm going to run out of time and only talk about vector and no tensor field visualization today. Uh, I think the lesson here is probably we need se a separate sci-biz lecture for <laughs> tensor field viz. Um, but um, I'll just really briefly mention uh, hedgehogs, uh, which are uh, before, uh, before we came up with the, with the characteristic curves uh, and surfaces for the vector field and for te texture-based techniques, Hedgehogs were sort of the standard obvious way of visualizing a vector field. Um, they're bad for obvious reasons. Uh, try doing this in 3D for a very, very, uh, very, very large vector field, and you're not going to get much information out. But uh, actually, as Alex said, they're really excellent at showing orientation because the, the point in space is fixed. It stays with the grid. Um, 
And in some ways, you can actually combine these with characteristic curves, put hedgehogs on the characteristic curves, and um, scale them with respect to gradient magnitude. So when you do this, you actually kind of get the best of both worlds. And Mike Kirby actually had um, papers uh, along these lines in the late 90s that were doing exactly that. So again, hedgehogs, not necessarily the greatest removing, at removing clutter, but they're very good at showing direction um, because you're fixing them in space and you're showing kind of the general, uh, general direction of the vector field. So um, that's sort of the, the direct glyph-based. Uh, now I'll talk about direct volume-based approaches. Um, now the dumbest ones are things like taking the Laplacian of the, ve of the vector field or even just standard gradient magnitude, uh, turning that into a scalar field and volume rendering that. Um, there's no shame in this. I've actually made some very nice visualizations from doing exactly that. Um, a much more complicated uh, and much more sophisticated way of doing this is something called FTLE, finite time in the Opinov exponent. And I won't go too much into the math of this, but the basic idea is that you are looking at the evolution of particles over time from an infinitesimally small region of space, and you're seeing how far those particles move in the vector field um, if you advance over time. And you want to somehow condense that, condense that into a metric that will then become a scalar field, and you're going to measure that. Once you do that, once you're measuring, uh, measuring how far particles move over time as a scalar, what you're really doing is you're measuring something called Lagrangian coherent structures, which are a fancy way of saying the sources and sinks of the vector field. Um, and there's a whole pipeline for how you do this, where you start with the flow map, um, which is sort of this continuous field of representation of flow. Uh, you uh, spread particles around the direct, the, you, uh, find out where they went and build a tensor out of that. You take the eigenvalues of that tensor, you take the, uh, the log of it and normalize it, and then you end up with your, with your scalar. And then you end up with a visualization like this. This is actually kind of a good place to leave off. Um, I'll just show this one video, which shows you why volume visualization is still kind of useful for vector field flow visualization. And these sources and sinks, oddly enough, are things that would be very, very tough to show with streamlines, stream surfaces, et cetera. You'd actually have to wait for the characteristic curve and surface geometry to make their way in and around uh, the sources and sinks that you're, actually, that you're actually seeing. Whereas in this approach, you can actually see the sources and sinks all in one place immediately. So can I ask a question about how do like people use this? Is it like, do they ah two comparative designs? So this sounds very harebrained, but a lot of this is motivated directly from the fluid dynamics literature. So I, I was a little bit skeptical about FTLE myself when I first saw uh, Christoph Gard and Zambia Trakosh working on this, but if you actually go, uh, you go back to their papers and you uh, read the fluid mechanics books, things like this, which are really just kind of hacky metrics for the fluid dynamics community, they show up everywhere. And in a sense, it, it, it kind of makes sense. There, um, it's not high math, but it is sensible statistics, and it sort of shows where the sources and sinks would be. Um, and keep in mind that we have metrics for these sources and sinks, but we don't have metrics for where vortices are, for example. That's something that you really need topology to not even define, but, but get some sort of in, in, intrinsic sense for. Um, so I think that's the motivation for why, you, why you'd use something like FTLE. Is it's in the literature, the, the um, CFD scientists understand it, um, and it tells you something. Um, and then lastly, I'll just, just mention two volumetric, um, physically-based approaches. One is virtual rheoscopic fluids, which is essentially putting a whole bunch of particles in the, in the flow, in the vector field, and um, finding out how they're oriented, and then, lo and then looking at um, the, uh, the reflectivity that you would get from the shape as the vector field moves over time. And this is something that you can actually do in real life in experiments. So a lot of CFD scientists actually uh, like this. And there are two papers in VIS 07 and VIS 08 by different authors that more or less did this. Um, and let's see, I think I will just end with uh, one last example of why you'd use topology for flow visualization. The, the idea is that um, flow topology versus uh, scalar field topology are not actually all that different. 
Uh, it looks like I'm way over time here, so anyone who wants to go absolutely can. Uh, <laughs> they're, um, so they're not actually all that different. And um, it, it, the critical points um, of, the, of the scalar field correspond more or less to critical points of the vector field with some caveats. I have a whole section on flow topology at, at the back of these slides after the tensor field uh, visualization that I won't have time to get to. Uh, we probably need a whole extra lecture <laughs> to, uh, to cover these topics in depth uh, or at all. Uh, but the basic idea is that once you do this topological, topological decomposition, you're able to um, do things that are even more sophisticated than the streamlined bundling approaches that I showed before. You're able to decompose space into regions of like flow. Uh, and this is useful. There are techniques like the uh, helpless hodge decomposition. Harsh Bhatia here at SKI was doing a lot of uh, research in this area. Uh, also Josh Levine at Clemson. Uh, so th this is, I'd say, an ongoing area of research where people are using this to identify common patterns in climate or oceanography data. And I think that's a good place to stop, actually. Uh, there will not be any tensor field visualization questions on the <laughs> exam. Uh, Maybe you can rearrange something that you can have half an hour for lecture. Half an hour, actually, would, would probably we'll work see. great. Okay, um, thanks. Next week, uh, your personal meetings with your TAs about projects, please be sure to be there and bring your teammates. Everybody has to go. Um, and then we'll see each other again Tuesday before Thanksgiving.